video will explore the artwork and romance between Marjorie Organ and Robert and Henry. And yes, it is Henry. He was born Robert Henry Kozad in Cincinnati, Ohio, to Teresa Gatewood Kozad and John Jackson Kozad, a gambler and real estate developer. Henry was a distant cousin of the painter Mary Cassatt, whose family fortune was in railroads. In 1871, Henry's father founded the town of Cozadale, Ohio. In 1873, the family moved west to Nebraska, where John J. Cozad founded the town of Cozad. In October 1882, Henry's father became embroiled in a dispute with a rancher, Alfred Pearson, over the right to pasture cattle on land claimed by the family. When the dispute turned physical, Kozad shot Pearson fatally with a pistol. Kozad fled to avoid manslaughter charges. He was eventually cleared of wrongdoing, but the mood of the town turned against him. The family fled first to Denver, Colorado. In order to disassociate themselves from the scandal, family members changed their names. The father became known as Richard Henry Lee, and his sons posed as adopted children under the names Frank Southern and Robert Earl Henry. In 1883, the family moved to New York City, then to Atlantic City, New Jersey, where the young artist completed his first paintings. In 1884, Henry enrolled at the Pennsylvania Academy of the P Fine Arts, otherwise known as PAFA, in Philadelphia, where he studied under Thomas Anschutz. In 1888, he traveled to Paris to study at the Académie Julienne, where he studied under William Adolphe Bougereau and embraced Impressionism. With time, he was admitted into the École de Beaux-Arts. He visited Brittany and Italy during this period. By the end of 1891, he returned to Philadelphia, studying under Robert Venot at the Academy. He was 21 years old when he first enrolled at PAFA and he would return to it again and again over his lifetime. If you have not visited PAFA, I recommend it. It is an incredibly beautiful building. This was a time of emphasis on anatomy at PAFA and the proximity of Philadelphia medical colleges such as the University of Pennsylvania to the school with open air operating rooms were used by PAFA artists. Thomas Eakins also would watch young men bathing and rowing in the nude on the Schuylkill River, and so there was an attitude of realism at PAFA at the time. In 1892, Henry began teaching at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women. In Philadelphia, Henry began to attract a group of followers who met in his studio to discuss art and culture including several illustrators for the Philadelphia Press newspaper, who would become known as the Philadelphia Four. This was William Glackens, George Lukes, Everett Shin, and John French Sloan. These gatherings became known as the Charcoal Club, featuring life drawings and readings in the social philosophy of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, Emile Zola, who was very concerned with the life of lower classes in Paris, and Henry David Thoreau, who introduced German transcendentalism to America. By 1895, Henry had come to reconsider Impressionism, calling it a new academism, and he started to reject it. For several years, Henry divided his time between Philadelphia and Paris, where he met the Canadian artist James Wilson Maurice. Maurice introduced Henry to the practice of painting pochades on tiny wood panels that could be carried in a coat pocket, along with a minimal kit of brushes and oil. This facilitated the kind of spontaneous depictions of urban scenes, which would come to be associated with Henry's mature style. In 1898, he married Linda Craig, a student from his private art class. The couple spent the next two years on an extended honeymoon in France, during which time the French government purchased his painting La Nige, or The Snow, to be displayed in the Musée du Luxembourg. From his letters held by Yale University, Henry, Henry was obsessed with art and how to sell his own. He emphasized the need to advertise to his wife and thought he could get 40 to $50 a painting. 
His letters are full of details about his trips on trains across France to meet with galleries. He inquired about her teeth, as it seems she traveled back to New York or Philly from France for an operation. He also included little sketches and letters to his wife. He began teaching at the New York School of Art in 1902, where his students included Edward Hopper, Rockwell Kent, George Bellows, Norman Rabin, Louis D. Fancher, and Stuart Davis. In 1905, Henry's wife, Linda, long in poor health, died. After she died, he draped a portrait of her in his studio in black. The portrait was the first thing students would see when they entered and departed his studio. It wasn't until two years later that he really started socializing again. His contemporaries were very concerned about him since he publicly claimed his heart was broken. In 1906, he was elected to the National Academy of Design, but when painters in his circle were rejected for the Academy's 1907 exhibition, he accused fellow jurors of bias and walked off the jury, resolving to organize a show of his own. He would later refer to the Academy as a cemetery of art. He attended the artist's ball at Tuxedo Hall in 1907, where he was dressed as a Spanish Hidalgo. He spotted Marjorie Organ, a pale woman with red hair, hiding behind a mask. Her red hair contained a white ribbon. An account of their meeting was published by the American Examiner. One has to remember that Henry had many friends who worked for various Philadelphia newspapers, and so details of his life are available in newspapers that wouldn't ordinarily be. At this ball, a woman was saying, I saw his girl with the red hair yesterday, which was a painting from 1903. I thought it magnificent. Her tone was gentle but decided. Tut tut, after all, what does a girl know about art? Mr. Chase says women do not take their art seriously, but we men do. You men. There was a girl's contemptuous pity for the boy who was only as old as herself in tow. You're a very tiresome child. Do run away and play. I want to watch the dancers and guess who they are. Neither of them, one of them being Marjorie Organ, had noticed the artist Robert Henry as the conversation progressed. But he, seeing the tonal effect of a white ribbon in hair of red, bountifully shot with gold, had drawn near, irresistibly impelled by his art mistress. He had overheard the girl's praise for his work, the red-haired girl. The power to resist praise is superhuman. Had it been necessary to seek someone to introduce him to this goddess of appreciation, he might have summoned the vision of the portrait in his studio. But at masquerade balls, especially at balls of art students, introductions are superfluous. Pardon me, do you pose, he inquired, his eyes still fixed on the glory of her red-gold hair. No, in fact, I pose others a little. I am an artist, but a humble one. I have been doing a little work for the newspapers for two years. I want to get into magazines. I hope, yes, yes, you are ambitious, the master said. Had you a model for your girl with red hair, the girl asked? Yes and no. She never sat for me, but I saw her each morning on the L train, and I made notes of her wonderful hair. She was a wee scrawny awkward creature a schoolgirl i should have said she was timid one day i approached to ask her if she would come to my studio and pose but then she shrank from me so that i passed without speaking i have often wondered what had happened to that little girl i gave the picture the face of a woman but i kept the girl's hair that wonderful red hair Behind the mask, the girl's lips parted. They closed again in a smile. It seems that the girl was Marjorie Organ, and Robert Henry noticed her when the MC told all of the attendants to take their masks off. I thought so, Henry said to himself. I thought there would be nowhere else such wonderful hair as that. It is my little girl of three years ago. But the wee, scrawny figure has ripened. The timid face has grown, has grown serene. My little girl of the red hair has grown up. To one of his disciples, he said eagerly, the girl with the red hair and the beautiful complexion, who is she? That, oh, that is Marjorie Organ, an illustrator on one of the downtown papers. Introduce me. The follower obeyed. 
Miss Organ, looking up with laughter in her eyes, saw the Hidalgo bending over her. She rose. He knelt before her in mock humility. Forgive me for saying that I was wee and awkward and scrawny. It was quite true. But will you forgive me? Certainly. Oh, please get up. Why should the great Robert Henry kneel to poor little Marjorie Organ, the great painter to the beginner? Three weeks later, it was while they were hurrying over to Connecticut on an impulsive wedding journey, he reminded her of her speech. Love is the supreme lovelier, dearest, he said, presiding her hand, pressing her hand in the pocket of her gray traveling coat. In his eyes there is no master. All are beginners. When last month Robert Henry sailed from New York, taking a class of 20 pupils to sketch in Spain, the girl with the red hair went with him. At Granada, they sketch old castles and young peasants, and between whiles, the master is painting a new red-haired girl, his bride. No man's heart can remain in the grave. To no man except a very, very few can a woman need a more artistic abstraction. Marjorie Organ was one of the first female comic artists in America. Originally born in Ireland, she moved to America with her parents in 1899 when she was 13. She briefly attended Hunter College, but dropped out at age 14 to study behind illustrator Dan McCarthy. In the fall of 1902, at the age of 16, she gained employment as a cartoonist in William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal, the only young female artist on the staff. There she authored several comic strips, the longest being Reggie and the Heavenly Twins. She also published The Man-Hater Club and Strange What a Difference a Mere Man Makes. These comic strips are social commentary and often comment on men being in women's world situations. On May 5th, 1908, Henry and Organ were married. Although she continued to manufacture drawings and paintings after that, she was more frequently his model and spent much of her life orchestrating their social life. She was a proponent of common sense dressing to prevent clothing fires, which was also a favorite cause of Oscar Wilde's wife, Constance Wilde. Many of the flowing garments popular at the time would cause incredible damage to women when they knelt over fireplaces or stoves and so there was a huge movement in England and the United States for women to dress more simply. In February 1908, Henry organized a landmark show entitled The Eight after the eight painters displaying their works at the Macbeth Gallery in New York. Besides his own works and those produced by the Philadelphia Four who had followed him to New York, there were paintings by Maurice Prendergast, Ernest Lawson, and Arthur B. Davies. These painters and this exhibition would become associated with the Ashcan School, although the content of the show was diverse and that term was not coined until 1934. The, exhib the exhibition was intended as a protest against the exhibition policies and narrowness of taste of the National Academy of Design. The show later traveled to several cities from Newark to Chicago, prompting further discussion in the press about the revolt against academic art and the new ideas about acceptable subject matter in painting. Henry was by this point at the heart of the group who argued for the depiction of urban life at its toughest. Conservative tastes were somewhat affronted. About Henry's Salome of 1909, critic Hughes observed her long legs thrust out with strutting sexual arrogance and glint through the overbrushed back veil. It has far more oomph than hundreds of virginal genteel muses painted by American academics. He has given it urgency with slashing brush marks and strong tonal contrasts. He's learned from Winslow Homer, who painted American hunting scenes from Manet and from the vulgarity of Franz Halls. In 1910, with the help of John Sloan and Walt Kuhn, Henry organized the Exhibition of the Independent Artist, the first non-juried, no-prize show in the United States, which he modeled after the Salon de Independent in France. Works were hung alphabetically to emphasize an egalitarian philosophy. The exhibition was very well attended, but resulted in few sales. The relationship between Henry and Sloan, both believers in Ashcan reali realism, was a close and productive one at this time. Kuhn would play a key role in the future 1913 Armory show. Biographer William Innes Homer writes, Henry's 
emphasis on freedom and independence in art as demonstrated in the exhibition of independent artists. His rebuttal of everything the National Academy stood for makes him the ideological father of the Armory show. Annual shows followed this 1910 show in 1911 and 1912. The 1913 Armory Show, America's first large-scale introduction to European modernism, was a mixed experience for Henry. Organ, his wife, was one of the artists who exhibited at this landmark show. Although she was already married to Henry, she showed as Marjorie Organ. The work included several of her drawings listed as drawings numbers 1 through 6 for $50 each. Henry exhibited five paintings. But as a representational artist, he understood that cubism implied a challenge to his style of picture making. He was not yet 50, but saw himself as a vanguard and leader, and he thought he was about to be relegated to the position of a conservative whose day had passed. I argue that his time, his work was is timeless and shows America as we knew it then and as we know it now in many ways. So while he was very worried about cubism, I don't really think he had he had much need to be. Arthur B. Davies, an organizer of the show and a member of the Eight, was particularly disdainful of Henry's concern that the new European art would overshadow the work of American artists. Henry was devoted to American students, men and women. He was devoted to the idea of American art and uplifting American art. So he was very concerned that his gallery spaces would be taken over by European cubists. Henry had a keen interest in all new art and recommended that his students avail themselves of any opportunity to study art. He urged painter Charles Sheeler, for example, to visit the Albert C. Barnes Collection of Modern Art in Pennsylvania. The Barnes Collection was moved from the Philly suburbs to be in Philly in direct contradiction to the will of Albert C. Barnes, and in my opinion, that collection should have stayed where it originally was. Uh, Barnes intended it to be viewed by servants and the working class and wasn't interested in having it viewed in Philadelphia itself. Henry admired anarchist and Mother Earth publisher Emma Goldman and taught her from 1911 onwards at the modern school. He taught all kinds of people, so I don't think this is particularly noteworthy. Goldman, who later sat for a portrait by Henry, described him as an anarchist in his conception of art and its relation to life, which I doubt because when we look at his plans for the Armory show, it, was not, it wasn't anarchy at all. It was very, very organized. Henry was a lifelong student. It wasn't so much about an ideal as about learning and constantly growing. His work stands for itself, and his ability to change moods in his work over time isn't reflected by the cubists or modernists who largely stuck to one degenerate theme their entire careers. Henry made several trips to Ireland's western coast, the country of his wife's birth, and rented Cory Moore House near Duav, a small village on Achill Island in 1913. Every spring and summer, for the following years, he would paint the children of Douai. Henry's portraits of children, seen today as the most sentimental aspect in his body of work, were popular at the time and sold well. In 1924, he purchased Cory Moore House. In the last years of his life, Henry spent a considerable amount of time, half the year at a time, living on the island. Amongst the children he painted were siblings Marianne and Thomas Cafferty. He painted Marianne on several occasions, including Pink Pinafore in 1926 and the Pink Ribbon in 1927. As the Courier Museum describes the painting Marianne with her basket, Marianne is shown to be about 10 years old, wearing a pink smock over a black dress and holding a rectangular basket in her arms. She gazes at the viewer with large dark eyes. Her serious expression is framed by wavy black hair tied back in a pink ribbon. As the Courier Museum explains, the painting is not unlike many of Henry's other portraits of children because he treats his young subjects with little that is sentimental or indulgent. The sense of frankness that characterizes the sitter stems in part from Henry's realist bent, 
yet it is also a testament to the respect accorded to children by the artist. While living in Ireland, Henry established a bond of trust with the local boys and girls, and these images are notable for their easy dignity and naturalism. Henry himself was acutely aware of the ability of children to discern the genuineness of adults, and in his well-known treatise, The Art Spirit, he wrote, if you paint children, you must have no patronizing attitude toward them. Whoever approaches a child without humility and without infinite respect misses in his judgment of what is before him. His Irish works continue to be popular and one fetched over half a million dollars in 2013 at a Sotheby's auction. During the summers of 1916, 1917, and 1922, Henry went to Santa Fe, New Mexico to paint. He found that locale very inspirational. He became an important figure in the Santa Fe art scene and persuaded the, the director of the State Art Museum to adopt an open door exhibition policy. He also persuaded fellow artists George Bellows, Leon Kroll, John Sloan, and Randall Davey to visit Santa Fe. This portrait is one of 20 Henry painted during a two month stay in Santa Fe in the summer of 1916. His subject, Diaguito Roybal was a member of the Tesequue Pueblo tribe, and here the artist has depicted him wearing a yellow jacket, green pants, and white moccasins. Between his red blanket covered legs sits a large drum, which he would play during important tribal ceremonies, a fact that is reinforced by the mallet he holds upright in his hand while he stares fixedly out at the viewer. Henry was invited to stay in Santa Fe by the director of the American Archaeology School, who was an admirer of his work and so set him up with a studio in the prestigious Palace of the Governors. According to Perlman, Henry or originally made a memory sketch of the subject as he appeared drumming and chanting the Eagle Dance during a rehearsal for a performance that was held on the patio right outside of the artist's studio. Henry presented the work to the Museum of Art and Archaeology immediately after its completion, and Diaguito would sit by the hour, staring solemnly at his likeness, oblivious to anyone else in the gallery. The indigenous people he saw and the new culture he experienced had a profound impact on Henry. He later told his students, I was not interested in these people to sentimentalize over them, to mourn over the fact that we have destroyed the Indian. I am looking at each individual with the eager hope of finding there something of the dignity of life, the humor, the humanity, the kindness, something of the order that will rescue their race and the nation. In 1918, he was elected as an associate member of the Tao Society of Artists. A former... A for a formidable figure in the art world, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's first interaction with Henry was in 1915, when she was establishing her charitable organization, Friends of Young Artists. At her request, Henry, with fellow Ashcan artists George Bellows and John Sloan, served as jurors for a benefit exhibition for her organization. Presumably, Henry relaxed his stated aversion for juried selections because of the event's charitable status and the power held by a Vanderbilt Whitney. Whitney duly commissioned Henry to paint her portrait, although she exercised considerable control over how her commission was to be executed. Where one might have expected Henry to apply the blended Murata color system he was employing elsewhere, author Bernard Perlman discusses how Whitney rather chose to wear a brightly colored Chinese costume that she had purchased in San Francisco a blue jacket with red decorations and yellow lining over a loose-fitting pale blue-green blouse and silk pants and embroidered Chinese slippers. Added to that, she is seen reclining on a gray sofa. A tapestry that provides a mass of decorative foliage frames her bobbed hair, while a bracelet, four rings, and a string of pearls are the finishing touches of this portrayal, at once sumptuous and provocative. I've seen various copies of this painting seemingly having an extra strand of pearls extending off of her neck. I'm not sure if he was experiencing with some surrealist symbol in these other copies, but it's a very interesting addition. 
The painting was not without controversy and provides a good example of Henry's approach to realism. As the Whitney Museum describes, Mrs. Whitney's husband, Harry Payne Whitney, refused to allow her to hang it in their opulent Fifth Avenue townhouse. He didn't want his friends to see a picture of his wife, as he put it, in pants. Mrs. Whitney's attire and self-possessed demeanor were highly unusual for a well-bred woman of her day. Henry transformed the traditional genre of a recumbent female, usually a nude courtesan or the goddess Venus, into a portrait of the quintessential modern woman of the time. The portrait hung in Whitney's West 8th Street studio, which in 1931 became the first home of the Whitney Museum. In this next portrait, a young woman, the professional model Edna Smith, is shown in front of a dark background. She is draped in a Japanese style shawl that wraps around her shoulders. Covered in white and red flowers and vibrant green leaves, Edna draws our attention to the garment with her right hand, which holds it in place across her chest. Edna Smith was a favorite model of Henry's in 1915, and she had already appeared in several portraits that year, including some of her nude or semi-nude. I've read various scholarly accounts on Edna Smith appearing nude, trying to insinuate some sort of relationship with her and Henry. Maybe, but she was a professional model, and so getting naked for her clients was part of her job. With her red hair and pale skin coloring, Edna represented the artist's preference for a particular type of model, which included the dancer Jessica Penn and his second wife, Marjorie Organ. In similar paintings, we can see Organ making a very, very similar uh, pose to Edna Smith's. And so, and she's dressed in a similar way with the shawl and the coloring is a little bit similar. So I wonder if Marjorie saw this painting and thought I can do better because she was painted by other artists, not just her husband. This portrait is more animate than Henry's earlier works, underlining the artist's move away from the darker palette associated with the Ashcan school and his relatively newfound belief in the harmonious qualities of color. According to the Indianapolis Museum of Art, Edna's portrait is quite typical of Henry's ability to capture his subject's spirit, but by now, from around 1909, he also adopted the color system of theorist Murata, which assigns a letter and number to 144 harmonically related colors, sort of an early paint by number. Painters could use the system of letters and numbers to carefully plan the color relationships of their paintings, and so the rich harmonies of this image based on red and green show Henry's use of the Murata system. Having returned from a stay in Paris in 1900, when during his first marriage, Henry turned to his immediate New York surroundings for inspiration, using its streets as the subject for several paintings. Here he presents a clear winter view down 55th Street, which had recently been blanketed by snow. I believe he was also spurred forward by his success of a snowy painting in France and decided to stick to the snowy theme. In the aftermath of the snowstorm, there is little human activity and a lone horse-drawn wagon struggling to make it down the street in the right foreground of the canvas offers only a hint of any narrative element. This painting was made while Henry was the de facto leader of the group that would become known as the Ashcan School. It bears many of the hallmarks of the Ashcan style, loose gestural brush strokes, the preference for dark colors, and scenes that focused on the working class side of the city and its residents. Markedly different from the more traditional approaches to art seen in America at the time, according to Washington's National Gallery of Art, Henry's energetic but stark image of New York in the snow deviates from impressionist urban snow scenes of the period in several ways. It represents a common side street rather than a major avenue. There is nothing narrative, anecdotal, or prettified about the image. The straightforward, one-point perspective composition is devoid of trivial details. The exceptionally daring, textured brushstroke resembles a preparatory study rather than a finished oil painting, and the somber palette creates a dark, oppressive atmosphere. Henry would move away from the dark palette as his career progressed. 
While traveling to the United States after visiting his summer home in Ireland in November 1928, Henry su suffered an attack of neuritis, which crippled his leg. The underlying cause was metastatic prostate cancer. He was hospitalized at St. Luke's Hospital in New York. Gradually, he became weaker until he died of cardiac arrest early in the morning of July 12, 1929. His illness was not generally known and came as a surprise in art circles. Upon his death, artist and pupil Eugene Speicher said, not only was he a great painter, but I don't think it much to call him the father of independent painting in this country. At his death, it was reported that he was cremated and his ashes buried in the family vault in Philadelphia. His wife, Marjorie Organ, would also die of cancer one year later in 1930.